All right, friends, let's get started. Um, really lucky to be joined by a few wonderful people today. So we'll introduce them in a little bit, but welcome those that are, of you that are calling from Colorado and Santa Fe and California and Maine and Pennsylvania where the snow just stopped and New Jersey where it's, it's bright. And so I'm excited to be here with everybody. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes, as you know, um, if you wanna to chat to the whole group, just make sure to select all attendees and panelists. Otherwise it just goes to a few of us. We'll send the recording and slides around later today so you don't have to furiously take notes. Um, and then we'd really love, as usual, for you to fill out a survey at the end. This helps us shape uh, some of the, the future conversations we'll have, as well as a couple of uh, cool things that we want to invite you to. So um, welcome again. Uh, we are going to talk through how fundraising teams are staying happy and productive in 2020. Um, today's agenda, we'll go through a couple of quick things. Um, we'll do intros as usual. We'll do a quick note on the CARES Act because there's been a development in the legislation that a lot of people are making mistakes about. So we'll try to rectify that. And then we've got two amazing experts. So things are a little bit different today. But we'll hear from uh, Julia Silverielt, who's a world-class expert on building great remote teams. And then Kathy Sheffield, who's one of the smartest minds in planned and major giving about building connection and finding joy with donors. So we have a whole lot of new ideas from, uh, from this community, which we'll share. And then we'll just go through some next steps in Q&A. So welcome again. Hope everybody is uh, comfortable and ready to go. So uh, many of you know who I am. My name is Patrick. I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of, uh, of Free Will alongside my brilliant co-founder, Jenny. Um, we're really lucky to be working alongside 300 amazing nonprofits, um, a great team of 55 people around helping people move to digital plan giving, digital major giving. Um, and that's just been a joy. And so we're doing everything we can to support you in this moment. We also heard from you guys and you know some really promising wonderful trends here as we, we've talked about this week over week but you can see the blue line is overall happiness uh, and the yellow line is anxiety and anxiousness it creeped back up a little bit in week eight after week seven um, and but also eagerness and loneliness has sort of peaked up a little bit as well so just really interesting data to share so if you're feeling one of these things or more likely four of these things at the same time uh, you're certainly not alone here We've also kept asking people about what you're worried about. And we're sort of seeing this steady, uh, steadiness around hitting goals and people trying to navigate how the team is going to work going forward. Um, people are feeling a little bit more comfortable about safety overall. Um, and generally, I think people feel a little bit more secure about their work, um, that, that their jobs are more secure because things have settled out a little bit. So some positive trends there, um, but also some real concern about being able to do our jobs well in this period. So hopefully this will be helpful to you. And I'm particularly looking forward to hearing Julia give some tips on this as well. Um, so a quick note on the CARES Act before we dive in. Um, there's been a lot of questions around the $300 deduction. This is the above the line deduction. And we just wanted to address it quickly because we see in some of our conversations with partners and other nonprofits, just a lot of confusion around what that means. And a lot of people are actively marketing this to donors at the moment. So getting it right is gonna be really, really key. So big things to know, the CARES Act implements a new $300 above the line deduction, meaning regardless of whether or not you itemize your deductions, you can, you can take this as a taxpayer. Now, this is critical because as we've talked about in the past, especially in the shifts to qualified charitable distributions, fewer than 10% of Americans will itemize their taxes this year. That would have been 30% in 2017, but the, the Trump tax cuts really shifted the way that itemizations happen and things like mortgage interest and state and local taxes are not deductible to the same degree as they were previously. And so that's kicked a lot of people out of the itemization bucket into the non-itemization bucket, which makes the $300 above the line deduction really key. But the important thing, and this is what people are making mistakes on, so we just wanted to make sure you knew about it and weren't making the same mistakes, is that this is per tax filing. So that means that if you are um, a married couple filing jointly, it's still $300. If you are a head of household with four adult children who are currently living with you, but you're paying taxes for everyone and you're treating them as a, um, as a deduction, it's still $300. So you don't get to bump it up based on uh, various folks. And so want to make sure that's key. Some people were thinking about pitching $600 to married couples. They can still give $600, but the tax deduction is only 300. So we want to make sure you got that right as people are figuring out a lot of their messaging going forward. So 
Uh, side note on cares aside, let's dive into how teams are managing with changing times. And we heard a lot from folks today, but um, you know, one of the things that we keep coming back to is that this is not gonna be a quick, uh, a quick win or a quick passage through a crisis. And we're feeling this actually most acutely in New York right now. And there was a big article in the New York Times over the weekend that basically talked about how New York, sadly, is probably going to be the last place in the United States to reopen. Um, we are so heavy on public transit. Everything is crowded. You know, there's not much to do in New York that doesn't involve tons of people. And so um, not only are we sort of one of the first alongside Seattle to really get hit hard, but it may go on for a long time. And so I think a lot of folks that I know here are thinking, okay, what does it mean not just to get through the early chaos, which is where we've been, but into the long grind? Um, and what does it mean to sort of reshape our lives for six months, a year, a year and a half, two years, um, not really knowing when things will be back to normal? And um, some people are in this period where they're just like, oh no, of course it's gonna be fine soon, it has to be. But looking at the data and really understanding it, we might be here for a while. And so thinking about how to reset your new normal in a way that still brings you happiness, productivity, joy, connection, et cetera, is gonna be really key. And something that I'm personally thinking about a lot these days for my own life, for our own team, and I know a lot of you are thinking about this as well. Um, before we get into the data, I wanted to share one quote from Robert Frost, which is uh, obviously a famed American poet, uh, passed away in the 1960s. Um, but the only way out is through, right? There's no, there's no side door that the way we get through this crisis is just trudging through it. Um, this is from a poem called The Servant's Servant. I um, mean, it's worth a whole read if you get a chance to do the poem. It's about, um, it's about a, a female servant sort of grinding her way through life, um, but it's really profound and, and both sorrowful and joyful. So um, if you get a chance, it's in the public domain, you can Google it later. But we really, um, we wanted to do this session based on some feedback that we've gotten over the past few weeks. And when we ask people about how the overall team is doing, not just themselves, but how their organization is doing, um, anxiety is obviously one of the key parts here. Um, and loneliness is, is you know, the lowest, but still pretty notable, right? If you have 12 or 13 or 15% of your community feeling really lonely, that's a hard and stressful emotion to have. Um, it's also the case that when we ask people whether they've been more or less happy, almost half of people said our team has been less happy. 36% um, said it stayed the same and 15% said more. So pretty small fraction happier and a pretty significant portion is saying, you know, this, this sort of stinks and our team is trudging through it. Um, other data to share before we get into some tips around how to solve that. Um, teams have actually been through roughly the same on productivity levels. So 25% said more, 25% said less, about half said, uh, about the same. So there's some, some folks are struggling here. Some people are doing even better. Um, a lot of folks are in the same place. Um, obviously people have changed the way they collaborate. And so 67%, more than two thirds say they have. A lot of people talk about shifting to video, all the things that, that wouldn't be too surprising to you. Another cool thing is that at a quarter of organizations, roles have really changed. And when we really dug into the data and looked at some of the written responses here, the biggest way things are changing is that people who are previously uh, doing roles that, that may not still be, be able to be performed are moving into things like fundraising or other pieces. And so you have folks like museum tour guides who are now calling donors or folks in facilities at a higher ed organization who are calling their students them, which is really cool and giving those folks purpose because otherwise you would imagine they'd both be stressed about their jobs and a little frustrated at the little impact they can have. So there's some cool things. And a lot of organizations are uh, doing rapid fire trainings to help get these folks smart on how to have great donor conversations. They're not necessarily asking for money, but they're having that initial stewardship conversation. And if there's an opportunity, they can bring in a major gift officer or a fundraising expert um, and go forward from there. And then we've seen actually a huge investment, and this is really encouraging, in professional development. So 60% of folks said their team is encouraging professional development. Um, about a third said no, which we hopefully can turn that around. And then when we asked what were they doing, um, webinars were obviously a huge part of it. And so things like this and others, and so hopefully we'll be able to continue to do this. Um, and we sent around an email last week that actually gives CFRE credit for all of these. And so we haven't yet gotten this one approved because it's a week to week thing, but we'll let you know as soon as that happens. Um, 
All right, so let's talk about how the team can be happy and productive from home in this wild moment. And I'm delighted to introduce Julia Sibergelt, who is the chief of people at moveon.org. Um, Julia graduated undergrad from Wesleyan, got a nonprofit uh, certification in nonprofit management from Georgetown, which is my alma mater, got an MBA from the Haas School at Berkeley, where she did a ton of work around social innovation, um, led HR at the San Francisco Chronicle, worked at Greenpeace, and is now at Move On. And one of the coolest things about Julia and Move On is that they've actually been remote for decades. And so they've built a lot of the best practices in how do you run a nonprofit organization when everybody's scattered across the country and only meeting, um, only meeting from home. So uh, welcome, Julia. We're super excited to have you here. Feel free to take yourself off mute if you can. And I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so that we can have full video. Um, Hi. So, Julia, welcome. First, before we get do anything else, um, you're in Berkeley. What is bringing you joy today? Um, I think just the good weather. It was rainy yesterday, which we really we really need here in California, but um, it's not raining today, and I'm really grateful to get, get outside today, this afternoon. Cool. Um, well, let's dive in. We're so lucky to have you here, given all your experience. Um, you've seen a lot of people start working at Move On, which for many people is their first ever work from home job. So you've watched people make this transition for years, and your organization has seen people make that transition for decades. What's the hardest thing for most people about moving from office or cubicles or whatever it might be to kitchen table, Zoom, laptop, et cetera? Yeah, so I think there are a couple things that can be hard for people. Um, I think especially for people who are more extroverted, the lack of immediate like human interaction, um, I think can be challenging. And especially during this, this time, I think a lot of people are experiencing that since we can't be out and about and seeing friends and family in the same kind of way. Um, and then I think the other thing that can be challenging is just structuring your time and having it feel like you're going to work and feeling like your workday ends at some point too. Yeah, that makes sense. So, and how do you support people who are making that transition? Mm -hmm. um, so for us, I think some of it is, is just coaching people because I think people have different challenges and different needs of what they want out of work. Um, I think for those two things in particular, it's about figuring out um, how do you get social interaction? So I think there are a number of ways to do that with your coworkers, um, whether that's setting up one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, we, we had a, a colleague of mine set up a virtual game night last week. Um, it was sort of a happy hour alternative. Um, and like I personally have found that just making sure I'm carving out a lot of time to talk to friends is really important. Um, as long as I'm getting that social interaction, it doesn't necessarily have to be with my coworkers. Um, and then I think for structuring the day, I think having a specific place, if possible, that you do work and that you only do work there, whether that's a separate room or desk, or even if it's when I've been in smaller spaces, even like a different chair that I sit in at the same table where I might never eat at that spot, but um, that's my work spot. Um, and then having some sort of boundary at the end of your day, whether that's scheduling a walk for yourself or a workout class or a call with somebody, something that sort of marks the end of your day for you. Yeah, I love that. The sort of the beginning and end, the commute while being difficult in many cases for people also serves as barrier to begin and, and end. Um, and I, I know a lot of people that miss, miss their podcasts or miss whatever it is because they don't have that moment. Um, you know, when, when we think about productivity, and we'll start there and we'll move to happiness, there's really two parts of this, right? So one is you, your individual productivity. Can you get your own work done? And then the second is around team. So maybe starting with individuals, well, what's a tip for, you know, being able to concentrate, being able to be excellent at your own work, separate from being part of a team? Yeah, so I think setting setting goals and being clear with yourself about goals. And I feel like for most development professionals, people have pretty clear goals overall. Um, you know, that can vary team to team or depending on what kind of role you have. But what I mean is more like goals for your week and sometimes even for your day. I think that can be really helpful if you find yourself sort of wondering or feeling like, what should I do next? Um, I also think working in sprints, having an idea of what you wanna accomplish in the morning, um, Sometimes even doing like a 20 minute sprint where you shut off 
Slack and email and just focus on one thing for 20 minutes. It's, it's sort of shocking to me how much I can personally get done when I do that. Um, just even if I just do it a few times in a week. Um, yeah, so those are some, some general tips for productivity. Yeah, that's it. I learned that actually from a German friend of mine who was the most efficient person I'd ever met. And he would, she would set a timer for 30 minutes and call it a work sprint and do as much as humanly possible and not give herself any distractions. Um, and I guess the one other thing I'd add on this is um, Spotify and some other services have what's called focus music, which I, I think you and I have talked about in the past, mm -hmm. which actually what it does is it takes a little bit of your brain to avoid distractions. So your mind wanders less and it can be jazz or classical, but it's actually specifically calibrated. Um, and they're certainly free, uh, you know, if you don't have Spotify, there's free versions of this on YouTube or other things like that, but it can be great. Okay. And then shifting for a moment to teamwork, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's, that's obviously much harder for a lot of us I'm used to walking over and saying, hey, Jenny, what do you think about this? And just having that, that normal interaction, especially with people sort of outside my immediate circle. I feel like I work with four people very closely and I know everything about their lives, but there's another 55 people at free will and I see them a lot less compared to being in the office and seeing them in the kitchen or whatever it might be. So how do you guys work more productively as a team when you're remote? Yeah, so there are a couple things. I mean, one, we do, we do a lot of video meetings um, and we also use Slack. Um, a number of our teams use Asana also for project management. Um, but really what you're describing, and I think this is the biggest barrier, is really communication and making sure you're communicating with enough people. Um, and that can be intentionally sitting down and thinking about who you want to talk to that week at the beginning of the week. We also use a couple tools. We use something called Donut. It's a plug into Slack, pairs you up every two weeks with a different coworker for a casual conversation. Um, we also do once a week an all staff call and always a portion of that is a relationship building get to know you. Um, for example, last week we divided into groups of four on that call. Everyone on the, in that group shared um, for a couple minutes about what they do in their day to day and what they're currently working on. And then it was a five minute ask me anything where the other three people could ask anything about, about their work. Um, so I think it's really about finding, finding those ways. And then the other thing I'll, I'll mention that we do um, that's similar to the work sprint is we will do work blocks together over Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, if there's something that's hard to do, like we did this a couple of weeks ago as a team, um, a smaller sort of sub team, um, where we all really wanted to update our documentation about how we do our jobs. In the event that anyone was out sick, it would be easier to cover for each other. So we all got on Zoom for an hour and a half. We didn't need to be talking during that time, but that way, one, it helped us stay focused. We could ask each other questions and it was sort of like being in a meeting room together um, in person. So, yeah. Love that. And let me, I just want to repeat a couple of things that I thought were really helpful and some folks are asking. So. One, you use Asana, which is a task management tool. Two, you use Slack, which many people are super familiar with and some are not at all, which is a, a messaging tool that can replace a lot of email and there's free versions of it available. And then within Slack, there's a plugin, which is, you can Google this, it's pretty easy to find, called Donut, which will randomly match you with someone else in the organization. So let's say you're at a college or a place with a couple hundred or even a thousand employees, that way you might connect with someone in, in facilities or in academia who might you know, you might never interact with because your fundraising team is pretty tight, but you're not having these sort of campus-wide meetings or even casual run-its. So that, that's, that's really smart. Another thing just down to you said is building in space for not just, you know, the gap between one-on-one -on -one meetings, which are mostly going to be with the closest people you work with, and these sort of all teams is how do you have four and five people gathering so you can, you can share things. Um, you know, most obviously meetings with 65 people are not useful from a connection standpoint in the same way. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as I shared earlier, I think a lot of people are struggling with happiness and morale. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that obviously is external to their workflow, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people are, you know, buying joy. And as you know, people in the fundraising world tend to be pretty extroverted because we all mm -hmm. signed up to go talk to donors a lot. Mm -hmm. And now we're hanging out on our, in our living room or at the dining room. How do you think about keeping folks happy? I mean, you guys aren't, aren't working from home for a couple of weeks. You're working at home for, for a decade at a time. Yeah, so I think it is um, 
about finding those ways to have some sort of connection and social connection. And that can look like a lot of different ways. But one example is within Slack for us, we have, we have lots of channels that are team channels or work stream channels. And then we have a bunch of fun channels. We have a currently reading channel. We have a plants channel. We have a pets channel. Um, we have a parents channel. So lots of different groups of people who are sort of sharing interests. Um, it's really fun. It's a way to get social interaction. Um, and I think, I think also um, another thing I would say is that I think sometimes people struggle in remote work and feel less happy when they're trying to recreate exactly the experience of work at home instead of just accepting like there are differences here, there are pluses and there are minuses. And how do you figure out how to fill the gaps for the minuses where you can and, um, and lean into the pluses. So that might mean that like I have a coworker who moved her, um, her treadmill into her, into the room where she works and she does some of her calls on a treadmill. There's no way she could do that in a physical office. Um, we have more time in our day because we don't have a commute. So figuring out how to not just work that extra hour, but how do you take advantage of that and, and, and be grateful for those aspects of it. Um, yeah, I think those are, those are some of the things I would say. And then I think finding, finding the ways also to your point, some of, one of the things that was really striking to me in one of those graphs you shared was just the inversion of, of anxiety and happiness, how those two things are pretty linked. So I think during this period too, part of happiness is how do you support and connect with each other um, and really make sure that people on your team feel okay, people on your team feel a sense of connection um, and people have what they need, um, whether that's flexibility in their day or a day off here and there. Um, I know for us, we decided for this summer, we're gonna close um, our, our virtual offices one day a month just to people aren't really taking vacation right now because people don't know what vacation looks like in this current world. Um, so how do you make sure there's sustainability in the work too? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right, I guess my last question, you know, I, I can imagine listening to you and thinking, wow, these are great ideas, but also she's the chief people officer. She can do whatever she wants, which obviously isn't true because you've got to go get all your whole team on board. But <laughs> let's say that I'm, you know, an individual giving manager and I've got three levels between me and the executive director how might I enact some of these changes without being, in, being the big boss? Yeah, um, I would say there are a couple of things. One, I think that in general, and this is my experience now as an as a executive in an organization, um, when people come to you with a problem and also an idea for a solution, that's like gold. Like that, that is what probably what your manager wants to hear. Um, mm -hmm. And if you come with an idea and you say like, hey, I think it'd be really valuable for us to create more connection amongst our employees. I really want to try this thing Slack or I really want to try this thing Donut. Can I, can I take on a couple hours a week of, of testing this out and helping roll this out? Um, if you're willing to put in some of the work and, and you come with some ideas, I think that um, will get you further than just bringing, bringing up that the team isn't happy. Um, so I would think about like, what if here really resonates for you? Um, and then also some of this stuff can just happen organically. Um, actually Slack, Slack, um, when they initially rolled out, suggested not having an entire organizational rollout, but having it start within a team and sort of learn what works in your culture and then having it spread organically. I think that can be true, whether it's one-on-one -on -one conversations or, or a small team meeting, you don't necessarily need to get your whole organization to agree to do an all staff call every week. If you can say to your manager, hey, I would love for our team to start meeting once a week if that's something that's not happening. Um, yeah, and, and sort of think small within your part of the organization and what you can be doing there. Yeah, that's great advice. Any parting words of wisdom for all these folks who are doing their best, doing amazing things around the country? Um, yeah, I think my last thought here is just like, when, when you are not feeling as excited or you're not feeling as happy as in your work um, or you're finding something about remote working frustrating, really trying to identify like, what is the underlying need that isn't being met for you? Is it, is it social interaction? Is it feeling not as productive? And, and what are the ways that you can sort of move the needle for yourself there? Um, 
and whether that's finding you know an internal accountability buddy or there could be lots of ways that it looks it doesn't need to look exactly like it looked when we were in physical offices that's great insight that this is sort of a moment for increased self-awareness and actually mm -hmm. information to help guide what you need amazing well julia thank you so much um folks julia is going to stick around so if we have questions later uh we'll we'll make sure that she answers all the, the ones she's well suited to so Thank you again, and glad to see that all is well in Berkeley. Yeah, thanks. All right, so I am really excited about, uh, really grateful to Julia, um, and really excited to also welcome um, Kathy Sheffield. So I want to talk a little bit about how great Kathy is, and then we'll welcome her. So um, Kathy is, uh, went to undergrad at, at North Dakota State University, go Bison, um, and got, I believe, an MBA at TCU, uh, go Horn Frogs, and is now the founder of Think Giving, which is one of the premier uh, plan giving and major giving uh, consultancies. She's based out of the great city of Fort Worth, Texas, where she is everything. She is the president of the AFP local chapter there, uh, and then nationally, she's on the board of the American Council on Gift Annuities, ACGA, which really does a lot more than just gift annuities, the past chair of the board of uh, CGP, the Charitable Gift Planners. Um, we can, you can go to a conference and with, be with Kathy and a dozen people will tell you, Kathy is my very best friend in the world. Um, she is one of the best people I've ever met at connecting with other folks, at, at bringing joy to other people, but also finding joy in other people. So um, Kathy, welcome. I'm gonna stop my screen sharing again so that we can all see you. Um, but feel free to turn on your video and unmute and we can dive in. Hi. Welcome. You've got a great microphone set up. I need to look into that. Thank you. I'll so, send you the link. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you've got a lot going on uh, in Texas. What's, what's bringing you joy before we get into all of the tactics and strategies that we'll do? So I have two things I want to share. I, um, a friend of mine and I have been talking about doing this project for a little over a year, and we just were so busy. We were so busy and we're not able to find the time to be able to do this. And of course, now we're able to find some time to do this and we're hoping that it will actually come to fruition by the end of the month. So that's one thing that I've been finding a lot of joy and it's semi-professional, semi-personal. Um, and then right now in North Texas, springtime in North Texas can be beautiful. There can be a lot of storms like there is right now today, but um, most of the time it's just gorgeous and I enjoy sitting out on my patio looking at, we have some peach trees and a nectarine tree and the, everything's green and beautiful. And I just love, love, love working outside and sitting uh, outside with my dog and my husband. So loving that. And what's your dog's name before we get too, too deep? Susie, in Susie Sue Sheffield. Okay, well say hi to Susie for us. Um, <laughs> she, you may hear her and or see her before perfect. this is, is over. <laughs> always welcome here. Um, you're one of the best, best people I know at least at building connection one-on-one, -on -one, um, both professionally and personally, but, but professionally and, and with, uh, with donors or with clients you're working with now, what are some of the ways that you're, you're really investing in that connection as a way to support them and frankly support yourself as well from a joy perspective? Sure, no doubt. Um, I'm finding a lot of joy in doing some of the things that we're doing right now. Uh, making phone calls, sharing text messages. I've been sending a lot of handwritten personal notes, not only to donors and clients, but to my friends. I walk to my mailbox every day and it's sad when what I get, I mean, if I get mail that day, um, it's usually junk mail still, but it's not the junk mail we used to get. Um, so I've just been, I've just been trying to stay connected with everyone. Julia mentioned that too, just, just reconnecting with folks you haven't talked to in a long time because we're doing more of that and then just staying connected to those in your life. I, I try to do five not, um, unrelated to anything in the world, text messages every day to random friends. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to send postcards every other, you know, send some of those out every day because postcards are just nice and quick and easy, but it, yet it still shows that you care. Yeah. And um, do you want to share the teabag idea? That you oh, shared a while ago? sure. Um, with, for, for a client that I have in Washington state, I work with some of their donors directly and I, got two bags of tea. Um, I don't have them on my desk right now. I'd share them. One was cozy chamomile and the other was sweet dreams by Bigelow. And I just sent two bags of tea and a little note that just talked about 
that I was thinking about them, that I hope this note made them happy. And then I found a really cool tea related quote that talked about shutting out the noise of the world. And this was when I was doing this, it's when every day we were all glued to the TV trying to figure out what was going on. And um, I, I've gotten a lot of great responses from that, but there's so many different things we can do um, that aren't. I, I received a, a note the other day from a friend who had stuck a piece of gum in it and talked about how we can stick through this and we're gonna go, you know, just do th great things together. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot of creative little things that we can do that help bring people joy. Yeah, and you know, you're working with a lot of different nonprofits, some of them small, some of them large. Um, let maybe first let's talk about sort of the small teams, right? That maybe seven or eight or 10 and, and frankly might be under a little bit more stress because they're unlikely to have the same kind of endowment that, that a large entity might have. Um, how are you seeing some of the small teams stick together and get through this? So uh, I think that, first of all, I, before, I, before I talk about how they're getting through this, I think that we need to remember if we are a manager, if we're managing a team or a leader of some, of even just a smaller team, we need to remember that we need to be empathetic and resilient and agile and transfer those um, transfer those downward when you're managing down um, so that, and maybe we need to manage it up too. But I think that um, we need to be able to do that. What I've been seeing, and, and Julia hit on this, is communication is key, making sure that you're staying connected to your team. And in the smaller shops, what I've, some of my clients and some folks that I've been visiting with have, have shared is that um, you may have a small organization and 80% of that organization executes the mission but only a very small few people in that, maybe only two people are working in the development shop. So right now, those folks are managing all the relationships and trying to get through this by writing grants and doing all that. And the rest of the folks, to quote someone I was, someone I was visiting with recently, they get paid to sit at home and not work where they're feeling overwhelmed. So I recommended to her, spread the wealth. And you've recommended this on your, on your webinars. At, em, embrace some of those folks that aren't necessarily actively involved in the development side and, and bring them into uh, communicating and engaging your donor base. As some other friends of mine have shared that in the small shops, you really do rely on each other and you're cross-trained really, really well. And um, I think that it's okay to ask for help when, uh, when you're needing that help in an area that you feel overwhelmed in. So that can be really successful if you're just reaching out and letting, letting folks know you need help. And then if you have a person that you went to lunch with every week or you, you know, did a happy hour every week and now you're not seeing those folks, schedule virtual lunches. I've seen a lot of that going on. You can even have food delivered to your house from the same restaurant and that way you are um, participating like you would have been if you were sitting across from each other. So I love the fact that we're being creative and um, figuring out how to stay connected. Yeah, I love that. Um, we have a great, uh, great note in the chat from someone who did stress relief tea bags for Heritage Society members and positive energy tea bags for administrators going through all the daily changes. And a lot of these, these things have, you know, frankly cost very little this oh, time of your time, um, but just incredibly thoughtful. And then one other thing I wanted to note before we move on is you sort of talk about what the role of a leader, you know, how, making sure you're getting empathy, making sure you're checking in on someone. And I think one of the experiences that's really helpful for people to remember is also that for those of you that are not necessarily the most senior person at your organization, like that person probably needs just as much human support as you do. And if you say, great, you know, just wanted to, before we start our one-on-one, -on -one, how's your family doing? How's your, how's, you know, how are you feeling these days? That will really open up that conversation because a lot of leaders don't necessarily know how to engage in something like this because it's so unprecedented. And right. so don't wait. And I remember, you know, there have been times at Free Will where, where folks who are a year or two out of college and, but really sort of stepping up, have sort of come to check in on me during a hard time. And it means so much. And it really helped change the tenor of the organization even though you know, they're not the most senior people here. And so it can be incredible for culture and you can do that, that pretty quickly. Yeah, I agree. And I will tell you that you know, they always say leadership is lonely. And, in, and this is a time where it need not be. And I love your idea of, of starting those meetings that you're having with your leadership. And if you haven't read the book, Managing Up, um, I feel like it can be very beneficial and probably really good during a time like this because it does teach you how to um, care for and assist those above you in an organization. That's a great point. And I think this is, this is the moment where people are going to change the trajectory of their careers 
by really sort of stepping up and, and managing up effectively. Uh, yeah. It's, that's a great book. And I think it's, managing up is one of those things that people don't realize is a skill. Um, and, and frankly, there's, there's this tendency in organizations, especially as you get larger, to view the provost or the dean or the president or the executive director as sort of not human to the same degree. Mm -hmm. Become a symbol of the authority and, and the, the, the institution itself and don't necessarily get thought of as like someone who's probably stressed about raising his or her children right now on top of everything else. And so checking in on those folks will allow you to connect with them at a really human level and, and be a really, really good thing and probably one that will bring you joy. I agree. And I, I believe that leaders respond well to that. If it's done, if it's done the right way, um, you want to do it in a, in a subtle way, not in yeah. a, yeah. Um, we talked about some of the, the challenges for small organizations and, 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 and someone in the chat noted as small as one, where it, yeah. which is a whole other challenge and we can get to that in the future. Yeah. But you know, the other risk is in a large organization, you can sort of get lost and it's very easy to not really understand what's going on if you're at home and you're talking to the same four or five folks every day. Do you have any tips for people who are uh, working at a large entity, you know, a big cancer research organization, a big university, et cetera, um, who are then trying to navigate and figure out, okay, how do I make my way in this giant behemoth of an institution where I used to see 400 people a day, at least, you know, out of the corner of my eye, and now I see three or five. Exactly. And I think that large organizations, even outside of environments like this, tend to work in silos. And those silos can create a very effective component, but it can also be very damaging to the entire organization. And, um, you know, I, I, when I worked in large organizations, and um, I have, uh, you know, we would have our once a month, all person staff meeting, and then our teams would meet more frequently. And I'm guessing that, and I'm hoping that most of these organizations are doing the same thing. However, I, I've been recommending for these really large groups to do an open, free, uh, like a coffee chat. So instead of running into folks that I didn't necessarily work directly with, but were, would see in the break room or see around the water cooler, the proverbial water cooler, um, I think that we can now open up a room similar to this, and maybe you assign somebody one day a week or one, you know, one day a month, and that person has to man the room for an hour, and if people show up, great. If not, then you have the room off in the background, but that way you can use each other as a sounding board. You can just kind of chit-chat that, but take that mental break and allow folks to communicate with each other like they would have if I walked past Sally's desk every single day and chit-chatted with her for five minutes I'm now missing that interaction and something like that would be very helpful um, and then why not uh, Julia mentioned game night you've done trivia night um, I know you've guys uh, y'all have done yoga um, I think Megan has done the yoga. And I think that there's lots of, of opportunities to, within these big organizations, to still have that interaction and encourage it. And I saw that someone wrote um, in the chat, or maybe it was in the question about how do you encourage folks to do this if they're not wanting to participate? And, you know, you can only go so far with folks. You're always going to have those one or two people in your office, no matter the size, that doesn't go to lunch with you and doesn't do the happy hour and doesn't do, but you keep inviting them. And I think that we need to still uh, remember that while they may not choose to join you, they're still being included um, in, that, in that opportunity. And at some point they may say yes, and then that's going to be their breakthrough. But a lot of folks don't get energy out of doing some of the things that some of us and most of us in this business I don't know the statistics on this, but most of us are really extroverted and, um, and thrive on interacting with others. So I think that for large organizations that you reference, like the 400 and those big, huge organizations, we need to break down those silos even more and bring folks into an opportunity to engage. Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting point around how do you help people who are a little bit more res reticent to change here? And, and one thing that you actually see in psychology and across industries is that as you become more and more of an expert, it actually gets harder to change, right? And so if you're new to the role, if you're just, you know, a year out of college and you've, you've signed up and you're working at the university and you, you know, you were at a student phone bank and now you're an assistant, like it's much more easy to be flexible. But for a lot of people, what's happening here is you have this expertise that's been gained and a status with that expertise. And so they're used to being right, they're used to being the smartest person in the room, as, because they have been and their experience has been really valuable. And then you enter a moment like this where everything changes 
And it's a little bit difficult to engage because you might encounter failure for the first time in a bunch of years. And you, or you might, you know, you might suddenly be the sort of eighth best person at how to have a Zoom call when really you're the single best person in the organization to have dinner with a major donor. And so um, really welcoming those people and saying, you know, as a manager, you might say, look, we expect you're gonna be bad at your job and redefining expectations, saying your goal in the next six months is to learn how to do this, not to be perfect. And really giving space for people to make mistakes is really key. And then one other thing we're seeing in a lot of organizations is sort of a pairing of a more senior person and a more junior person. And in many ways, the more junior person is, a, you know, in many cases, just from a demographic standpoint, is a little bit more tech savvy, but also a little bit more open to thinking about things differently because they're frankly not as practiced in it. And so they can benefit a lot from each other um, and solve a lot of cool problems. So I love those ideas. And, you know, we informally do these mentorings, uh, mentee, mentor, mentee and mentor relationships, and usually both end up being both roles. The mentee, right. the mentee becomes the mentor and the mentor becomes the mentee. And we don't need to just do it outside of our organizations. I love the idea of doing it within an organization. So good point. And that actually reminds me one more thing, which is if someone's feeling really stuck, don't, don't call and offer to help them. Call and ask them for help and get them to open up a little bit. And then you can say, great, is there anything I can help with? And they might say, oh, I'm really struggling with how to connect with donors on video chat, or I don't even know how to set this up. Can you do it? And That's brilliant. And I love, uh, you're right. Ask. Yeah. Yeah. It's an old Ben Franklin tactic to ask somebody for help as a way to form a great relationship. Well, he's a, he's a wonderful person to, uh, to mimic and live your life after. Um, Kathy, we, uh, you know, in, to many people, you are equally wise. So any, any parting words of wisdom before we uh, put you on pause for a minute? Yeah, no, I, you know, I, I want to say there's three things I want to, I, I just want to mention here that I feel are um, really essential for us right now. And that's what, the first one is to practice self-compassion. Hmm. And, you know, we are, are all struggling and self-compassion can, can make things so much easier. So be kind to yourself and take some moments during the day. You and Julia talked about um, the Spotify channel that you had talked about. I love, I've been utilizing more the Calm app and just taking a few moments during the day to do a little bit of self-reflection and meditation is good. So be kind to yourself. And then try something new, like where I'm finding so much joy is in partnering with uh, my friend Claire on this project. And I know it's going to be awesome when we're done, but I'm learning new things and um, I'm really enjoying uh, the skills that I'm able to add. And then finally, just stay connected, do socialize, do, do look for those ways where you can um, be connected to those people who bring you joy, whether they're professional or personal connections. And we need to remember all of us are probably working more than we ever have in our life. And when you work from home, it's difficult to shut off that clock sometimes. And just remember to socialize and not always be everything about work right now. And it seems like it's easy to do. So that's, and remember to laugh, right? Have fun. We need to remember to have fun. And people forget to do that during the day. When I, when I was, my last team that I managed, we used to have a four o'clock dance party. For like five minutes every day, we would turn on some great music and just kind of get it all out. And um, we can still do that. So just have fun. Thank you. And I love that you have a mustache just ready to go. Uh, it was on my desk. So amazing. keep it in my pencil drawer. My, my pencil jar. <laughs> and you're going to stick around for questions as well. Yes. Uh, we'll be wrapping up soon. Excellent. Well, Kathy, thank you so much. Uh, this was amazing. So um, before we uh, get to questions, I wanted to share a couple of ideas, some that we have, some from around the community, but some really cool things as people think about productivity and happiness, and then also some more just on creative fundraising. Um, so on the happiness category, uh, someone shared they have a director level Zoom every two weeks, which has been great because it actually just allows anyone to hop in and hear how other departments are doing to really solve that connectivity challenge. Um, Someone has a weekly good news sharing on Thursday, including anything around kids or the garden or what have you. Um, and then there's been a huge increase, as Kathy mentioned, in verbal and written thank yous. So uh, one thing I, I do at Free Will, and I haven't always uh, kept up with it, is I have a little 30 minute slot on a Friday where I can just sort of write thank you notes in Slack or over email. And my handwriting's terrible, so I send fewer postcards, but that's been really fun. And it's something that brings me a ton of joy and is, is really well received. Um, a couple other ideas. So in, in one organization, every meeting starts with an icebreaker due to the lack of a water cooler chat. And so this might be something like, what are you happiest about? Or what was your favorite hobby as a child? Or what's one thing you admire about your parents? 
and just gives people a chance to get to know each other a little bit more. And it also, this round robin format also creates space for really good listening, which is really nice. A um, couple people mentioned this and Julia alluded to it, thinking about additional off days if people aren't really taking vacation. Um, you know, some organizations have an unlimited vacation policy. And so in the absence of really pushing people, they might not take it as much in 2020, when really people do need that time to de-stress with a walk in the woods or something else that's safe. Um, and then as, uh, as Kathy just modeled, uh, encouraging people to wear silly hats or attire, having fun Zoom backgrounds and just making it a little bit more festive and interesting. Um, one thing I wanted to share from Free Will, uh, which has been really sort of surprisingly fun, is so when quarantine started, and this is probably from May or March 13th, 14th, we started working from home and I started sending daily videos to the team. So once a day, 48 seconds, 50 seconds, minute and a half, just sort of shouting out some of the, the high performers from the day before. And then we started rotating it. And then one day our general counsel took it on and took it to a whole other level. So our, our, my colleague Andy, who's wonderful and is our, our uh, legal expert here, uh, created, put a suit on, he's got lots of suits from his big law days, put a news background, did a whole fake news bash or news talk, including jokes like, all right, now for sports, and then just holding silence. So really fun. And that's escalated into my colleague Jack, who some of you know, doing a whole music session where he recorded himself several times playing the instruments that Jack plays. Um, my colleague Leah read a rhyming Dr. Seuss uh, model of shout outs to her child, which is really adorable. Um, my colleague Karen got her whole family into a dance party and then shared some of the shout outs. Um, my colleague Michael dressed up like the different characters of The Office um, and so on and so forth. Um, we told uh, we had an eight minute uh, dad joke, free will dad joke session. Uh, recently as one of the morning videos as well. And they've just been incredibly welcoming um, and really a great way to start every day. Um, so if you want to borrow this idea, here's how to do it. You just have one person sign up a day. They can do anything from 30 seconds holding an iPhone to their face and talking or whatever, whatever source of joy they want to share. And then people just send shout outs. Well, it's what we call sort of praise for something well done the day. So um, if my colleague Megan is doing it tomorrow, She'll just say, anyone have shout outs? We'll send them to her directly and they get rolled out and incorporated into part of the morning video and she'll post it the next day. So it's really fun, really cool. Um, relatively low effort because you're only getting, you're only doing one, one a month or even less, but um, just an incredible way to anchor every day around community that is sort of one of these things that evolved. We didn't decide to do it, it just happened. And we really love it. Okay, another great idea that I love um, and this is if you're at a school or something else with a relatively tight community. Um, so what happens is they have nominations um, where there's a, there's a garden gnome and a yard sign and families will sort of come, uh, move it to another household and it will just show up in the middle of the night um, and so on and so forth. And so it's a big hit in connecting the school community and people will take photos of it. Um, so this is a little bit off the wall, but really, um, really fun and interesting. So I'm really glad that the Washington Walford School shared that. Um, at American Heart, uh, they're doing really cool things around getting videos, not just from employees, but from people that are supported by their great work. And so they can then share this with the thousands of people that work at AHA and really help uh, to invigorate their day. And so this is an amazing Heart family. This young girl is waiting for a heart transplant that's made possible by so much of the great work that AHA is doing. And so um, things like that, you can imagine how motivating they are for a team to see. Um, on productivity, People have been using the what you hear in meetings that we talked through a couple weeks ago, which is where you just sort of solicit all the feedback you've gotten from donors. So you're not deciding for it, but you're really being a good listener. Um, Sana that Julia talked about, um, people are holding short, shorter meetings, but more frequently because you can't necessarily plan for two months in advance now, which is a really interesting idea. So you may wanna look at your meeting cadence and say, does this still meet our new world? Maybe we should do half an hour twice a week instead of an hour every two weeks. Couple others. Um, one thing that my co-founder Jenny taught everybody here, which has been really helpful, is in every email subject line, you say, great, do I need this by, by tomorrow? Do I need it by the end of the week? Do I need it in an hour? And so you can actually know what's important when you look at your email box. That saves a ton of time and keeps people very responsive. Um, being much more explicit about goals. Um, and then really cool work from the Marine Military Academy in 
Texas, where they had an incredible Giving, um, giving Tuesday, raised $25,000, mostly with social media. And you can actually go to the Marine Military Academy Facebook page to see more. I, I saw a lot of people asking for more examples around what people get, uh, did on Giving Tuesday. And this is a great example. Um, and then the main Waldorf school filmed, had, had this actually filmed previously, but had a student talk about how she, why she was chipping in a couple dollars from her own money as a way to go to donors and say, hey, can you help out as well? So really cool stuff is happening around the community. And I think this might be the last example at the Bushnell, which is a theater. Um, they are going back through the archives and sharing some of the really cool things. You can imagine that a theater doesn't really have new productions happening right now, but they, they're on their 90th anniversary. And so Catherine Hepburn was there for a little bit and they did a, a minute and a half video on Catherine Hepburn. Um, no filming, just you know, photographs and narration and really cool, uh, really cool stuff that can be pretty easy and can keep a theater community pretty engaged at a moment where you obviously can't go to the shows. Um, oh, and Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, is doing a walk the watershed. So another great way to raise money. You can Google this and see it in action. It's really, really well done. And we hope that it's gonna be really productive for them. Um, all right, so a couple of small notes to wrap up with. Um, community roundtables. So we've got recordings available of these for uh, these types of organizations. Um, go check it out if you wanna dig a little bit deeper into what people in your community are doing. Um, really helpful. Um, we're also doing a walkthrough of some planned and major giving tools, specifically for higher ed institutions. Other folks are welcome, but it'll be really targeted towards colleges and universities. That's happening tomorrow at one. So feel free to sign up for that in the survey if you want to. I know there's a bunch of folks going already, so it'll be nice to connect with other folks in higher ed. And I believe that's it. So quick resources summary on our side. We still have email and phone scripts, strategy memos. We've added a new phone scripts around how to ask for stock gifts to make that really easy for you because we know some folks are confused by it. Um, and we've also added a bunch of case studies of organizations that are successful with planned giving in this moment in case that's useful to see what other folks are doing. Um, we're also collecting our favorite emails from around the nonprofit world. So you can see some really cool examples there. Um, all right, next steps. So fill out the survey in the Zoom chat. Um, next week, we're gonna talk about fundraising during an election year. So I'm really excited about that. Some of you know I used to run email fundraising with President Obama and we're about to enter the craziest election, I think of our lives, almost certainly. Um, obviously the Trump dynamic is its own thing. And then on top of a pandemic and moving to mail-in, the fundraising for it will likely be off the charts. Um, the email, social media stuff will be overwhelming. And so what does that mean for a non-political organization? Um, how might you navigate a deluge of mail in September, October, November? Um, we'll talk more about that and some strategies to get around it and also really what to expect there. So that should be fun. And then if you have any creative ideas or anything you wanna share, um, just shoot me an email. Before we get into q and I have one favor to ask, which is we as an organization are doing a lot of research right now around donor advised funds and how to help people uh, get more gifts, um, how to connect better with the banks that are trying to funnel this money, but there's a lot of challenges there. And so there's another survey question, which is if you have 15 minutes in the next week or two and are willing to chat about your experience with donor advised funds, we'd love to connect. So just make a small note in the survey there's a question there for it and, um, and let us know. So uh, we've got some uh, questions. Um, I'll go through these. All right, so our first question, um, well, Julia, we'll let you take this if that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm managing not just work from home, but suddenly also uh, got two children, seven and nine years old, and they obviously need a lot of attention. And so my husband and I are balancing this. Any tips from the parents that move on or other folks you know who are not just sort of have a quiet space in the dining room, but are also dealing with all sorts of chaos that they didn't expect? Um, yeah, a couple ideas. And I know a lot of people are struggling with this right now. Um, so a couple ideas. One is just, um, it's, it's gonna, you're gonna have your kids on the screen, it's gonna happen. People, people get that. And I think that actually, um, I will say one of the things I'm seeing, we, we've been remote for a long time, but people didn't have their kids at home for the most part until this period. 
Um, I would say it actually can like build connection um, amongst people to sort of see the, see the full part of your life. Um, and then the other thing I would say is just being really open and honest with your team about what your needs and boundaries are, um, what kind of flexibility you need. You know, we, we have staff who are, you know, working half time right now, but then are really clear that even in that half time, like if their toddler has a meltdown, like their toddler has a meltdown. Um, and I think the more that we, as, as colleagues have that context, the more we can support each other through this period. Yeah, that's a great point. So basically one is if you're not a parent or even if you are a parent, make space for other people and say, we ex you know, set expectations early. We expect you might get called away suddenly. Just send us a text message, but go do your thing. And so, you know, people, especially if you have newer employees, they may be scared to ask of that. Um, and then secondly, you can use it to build connection. And my guess is if you're on a donor call and your toddler has a meltdown, um, they'll empathize as opposed to being horrified. So, cool. Um, Kathy, uh, this question might be for you. Can you share more about working with major donors and particularly anything that might have surprised you about how major donors are reacting in this moment? That's a great question. I, I think I've seen every reaction that can possibly come. Um, a lot of folks are um, hesitant to um, start conversations that they think will lead to gift conversations. Um, yet at the same time, um, I find that a lot of folks are really receptive to um, having some of those conversations. I think it goes to just, the, just what you and Julia were talking about. Having some of those conversations, being real, if, you're, if your toddler's screaming in the background, they will empathize with you. Um, and, and just ask them how they're doing and be ready to listen. I think listening is gonna be the key to maintaining those relationships. And just know that whether or not the conversation goes down, that opportunity where they say, well, you know what, I, I'm so glad that you're doing fine and I know, you know I'm doing well, what can I do to help your organization because you've shared with me all the things you're doing right now. I, whether that conversation happens immediately or happens in six months, it's still going to happen. And that connection that you are able to maintain with that individual will just glue them even further to your mission. I will say that there have been several reports, and of course, it's like a balance statement. It's, it's um, a moment in time. But the survey that Fidelity put out where they said that 54% of donors are going to maintain their giving this year as they did last year, and then I think 25%, um, that number may, may be pointed to off, but that 25% that were going to increase their giving this year. I think that's something that we need to look to as a huge opportunity and be really rallying around um, because folks, our donors are going to um, support us through this time. Now, again, it's like a balance sheet. That was one moment in time and who knows how much longer if things go on, what their feelings will be. But just knowing that with all the uncertainty going on, um, people are still gonna support us. So what's surprising me about my donors I think that um, I'm, I'm relieved to know that they're, they're supporting us the way they always have. You just have to be the one who kind of initiates that communication. Yeah, great. Well, let's wrap up there because I know folks have other Zoom calls to jump in at the top of the hour, but um, I think just to end on Kathy's note, one of the, uh, the biggest sources of joys for a lot of people now is being able to have purpose and, and uh, be helpful. And so I hope you guys are finding joy in your work. Um, and Julia and Kathy, thanks so much for sharing made a little bit easier, um, but also helping donors and other folks find joy in their ability to have impact. So awesome. looking forward to seeing you all next week. Uh, we'll sort of share updates of how everything's going here. And we'll talk about, uh, you know, you, know, you think 2020 can't get more pain until we get into the throes of a presidential election. So we'll, we'll share more about that next week. But really, thank you again to Kathy and Julia. And thank you guys for joining.